discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Take a listen to this. Terrence Scott, what do you have to say? I have to say why people hate you and and why you they supposed to love you and God is loving. That's what I'm talking about. Talk about out of the mouths of babes. Terrence Scott, a fourth grader from, the New, from New Orleans, asked the question that has been on the minds of many of us lately. Are we experiencing more instances of racism and hatred since President Barack Obama took office? Here to talk about it is Vivian J. Page, founder of Norfolk United Facing Race, John L. Johnson, executive director of the Hampton Citizens Unity Commission, Bev Sell, the co-founder of Norfolk United Facing Race, and our favorite conservative, Bill Thomas from Hampton University. Welcome, everybody, to the program. So have we been seeing more instances? John, let me start with you. And by the way, I do have to say this to our audience, because the last time we had a discussion about race, we had trouble finding people, black, white people, to come on the show because they were afraid to uh, appear racist. So we want to say thank you to you two <laughs> for joining us here on Another View. But what do you think? Well, you know, I, I, I come at this from a number of different perspectives, and it's hard for me to step back and, and to qu quantify it. Uh, I can talk about the qual qualitative piece of it. It certainly feels different and sounds different. Uh, it seems to, to have an intensity that I think seems to be fairly new. Um, but I think it's good to probe behind the questions and mm -hmm. to kind of see. I, I just sense we're into uh, a time period that is new for all of us. And with this newness, there seems to be a tremendous amount of anxiety and angst. Um, and I, I sense that there's a portion of our population who doesn't know who to direct that anxiety and angst towards. Well, you know, Lisa Godley put together a tape um, just to kind of take a look at some things that have happened since the president has been in office. Let's take a look at that. On November 5th, 2008, the very day Barack Obama was elected the 44th president of the United States, four students spray painted hateful, discriminatory and violent remarks and threats to the president elect in the Freedom Expression Tunnel in Raleigh, North Carolina. One week later, on November 12th, in Rexburg, Idaho, elementary students chanted, assassinate Obama on a school bus, according to an official with the Madison School District. On November 13th, 2008, signs hang on the office door of a University of Alabama professor after she posted a message against racism when someone defaced a poster of Barack Obama and his family with a death threat and a racial slur. On February 19, 2009, cries of racism were heard across the country when the president was portrayed as a monkey in a cartoon. A little over a week later, on February 27, the mayor of a small Southern California city was criticized for sending an email showing watermelons in front of the White House under the title, No Easter Egg Hunt This Year. Los Alamitos Mayor Dean Gross later apologized and said he wasn't aware of the racial stereotype that blacks like watermelon. On that same day, a police detective in Harrison, New York, was suspended over racial comments on his Facebook page. Rich Light reportedly wrote that under Obama, the Rose Garden would be turned into a watermelon garden and there would be a KFC set up right in front of the White House. On August 17th, a man carries a military assault rifle into an Obama opposition rally in Phoenix. On August 30th, 2009, Pastor Stephen Anderson of the Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona, told his congregation that he was praying for the president's death. On September 9th, 2009, U.S. Representative Joe Wilson shouts the words, you lie, during the president's health care address. While Wilson insisted his outburst was spontaneous, former President Jimmy Carter called it an act based on racism. On September 29th, Facebook removes a poll asking if President Obama should be assassinated. The Secret Service is currently investigating this and other potential threats, which have grown as Obama pushes health care reform. 
on October 13th, just four days after President Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, a swastika and the president's name was carved into the 18th green at the Lakeville Country Club in Boston. Now that was just kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of things that have happened. Vivian, are we being paranoid? No, not at all. Um, in my opinion, what basically we're seeing is this bubbling to the surface of the latent racism that exists in our society. We haven't really had in the past a target for that. And Obama, in my opinion, has become the target for all the nameless and faceless folks um, in the past that have been, been targets of racism. We've got some stuff in our society that we don't like to talk about, and racism happens to be one of them. Um, we had hoped, I'm sure a lot of people had hoped and had thought that we had progressed in electing a black president means that we don't have these issues anymore. But the truth is, is that the issues remain. And the ability for us to talk about these things and have conversation about issues of race um, is, is probably more important now than it's ever been in the past. Mm -hmm. But Bev, you know, everybody was so hopeful when Obama was elected because it was such a bi-racial, bipartisan, I mean, everybody was, was seemed to be singing Kumbaya and, you know, let's bring the country together. <laughs> yeah. So why all of a sudden does it feel like, it feels like it's all of a sudden? Because it's always been there. It's been there. It's, it's been stealth-like, but like Vivian says, now it's become, it, it's bubbled up and now there's this target and he's become the poster child, if you will, for, for racism and race, racist uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very sad to watch. It truly is. But it also feels, Bill, that people are seeing it, but they're not really saying much about it. They're not doing much about it. Do you agree with that? Sometimes I think I'm dreaming that if someone thought just because an African-American who's mixed race, totally competent, totally qualified, totally structured, seen as a black man, was going to make a difference in racial discussions or the outcomes, it's, to me, it's ludicrous. Uh, America has never respected Af strong African-American men, from Booker mm -hmm. T. Washington to Du Bois to, to leaders we have today. This, it just never has happened. Now, is that going to change? Yes. Uh, racism exists. Our problem is we fool around with it too much. What do you mean by that? We, we concentrate it on too much. I was better off 40 years ago in a totally segregated community in terms of looking at my history and my heritage as an African American than I am today. White folks are no more or no less racist, and some black folks as well, mm -hmm. than they were 40 years ago. That's the problem. And the problem, when economics turn down, these kind of things bubble up. This has nothing to do with Obama. It's an excuse for people to make this happening. I'm more concerned with the 253,000 African-American men who have died in American streets for the past 23 years. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about the 17 African-American males who a couple of years ago graduated from the entire Norfolk public school system. I'm more concerned about the city of Norfolk spending $11 million to do a town point park and then won't do $300,000 to do a boys and girls club up in Park Place in Norfolk. That's racism. The racism is the fact that we don't get our economic issues out. We don't get our educational issues out. I just looked at a poll today that said, uh, not a poll, but an actual count, that at University of Florida, out of 300 candidates for medical school, school, only four were African American. That mm -hmm. is what we need to deal with. This other stuff is just ploy, and it's being used by both blacks and white to leverage their positions. You agree with that, John, that, that we need to look at more serious issues? Uh, I, I, I think Bill and I would probably part some company here on this. I hear, I hear exactly what he's saying because I hear this uh, in our dialogues that we have, ongoing dialogue, and I do hear this from both uh, African American uh, folks and, uh, and Caucasian folks both across the spectrum. Um, I don't know that we can deal with it too much. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of come down to it. I think that we haven't dealt with it honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we found what it takes to get to where most of us would want to go. I don't pretend to have the answer, uh, but I would be on board to let's talk about and let's explore what? how can we get there. 
Well, you teach Diversity College, or one of the things that you all are doing through yeah. the Unity Commission, and when people are in your classes, what are they telling you? I get the full spectrum of, uh, and so listening to folks, I I think it's the issue is more complex than people on polar differences would mm -hmm. see it as being very simple. I don't think it's that simple. I th if it's that simple, I don't think we'd be here. It, it's it's very complex and it's multi-layered. It's got it's got issues of definitely issues of race, but it's got issues of economics mm -hmm. involved and class structure and uh, entitlement versus uh, empowerment I issues. I see Bill over there just shaking his head. No, you're, you're, just, you're, you're so wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The class Thank of African-Americans, in my opinion, no, 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 that. because that's look, at, look, at, look at Obama's cabinet. Okay. Look at the people that's running the United States of America. They're competent African-American men and women. Mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale, whatever top schools in mm -hmm. the world. We do not deal with race because it's not economically beneficial for certain power people and groups to make it effective. You can't teach me to like you. You can't have a diversity class and say, I'm going to like you. No. At Hampton, we even had the same issue with the, the our, with our, yeah, with our election of our homecoming. That homecoming is correct. Queen. Right. She right. happens to be white, yeah. and that's good. That's good. And some people had some issues with it until we educated them to understand why that was good. But to say that we're going to teach somebody to like somebody, we're going to teach somebody to like me, we are where we are as African Americans because we allow it to happen to us, in my opinion. I, I, I totally mm -hmm. disagree with that, Bill. Okay. To, to, say, to say that we are where we are uh, it is purely our fault. I didn't say it was our fault. I said it's because we allow it to happen to us. You said we allow it to happen. You said we allow it to happen. Yes. You can't, it's not a matter of allowing. First of all, I don't want to go back 40 years ago and live in the environment of 40 years ago. I was there 40 years ago. I, for that matter, I was at Hampton 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when the first two white students came through Hampton. So I've seen the effects of reverse racism as much as I've seen straight up racism. But... To say that the people who don't have the power, and this is, this is what, what, where it ultimately, in my mind, comes down to, when you have institutionalized racism, when you have a system that is set up that prohibits people from participating one way or another, Norfolk is a perfect example. Norfolk is a city that is almost 50-50 black, white, mm -hmm. almost 50-50. But the power sharing in the city is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. We have, we have, almost, we will never have more than we've got an eight-member council. We will never have more than three black blacks on the council. The way the system is designed, mm -hmm. which means we will never have more than an unequal number of people on the various boards and commissions that are appointed by that same city council. To elect someone black at the in city of Norfolk is almost impossible. So the process. When we have this process, and, and the process, the systems are set up that way. When you have it, and, I, and, and understand, I don't think I don't think that it's intentional. I really don't think sometimes people consciously say, "I'm not going to hire you because you're white." and everybody over here is black. Mm -hmm. We tend to look out and we see people that look like us oh, and we're more accepting we're more of people, people who look like us mm -hmm. than we are people who don't look like us. But that that is it feels yeah. like also that there is a, a deliberate attempt to marginalize the president in, in terms of, because it's, it's, it's almost more than, than that he's a black man, but, but to just annihilate everything that he stands for in terms of his education, in terms of the things he's trying to do right. to change the country. Right. That, that feels a little more insidious to me. Well, and, and I'm going to really rile Bill up here, but I'm going <laughs> to say I think this is where class comes in, too, because I think uh, he's well-educated. I think he's the closest thing we've had to a statesman in the White House in some time. So I think there's a, a little bit of the classism that's playing in there as well as the racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether you agree or disagree, um, um, that's what I think. So, um, <laughs> And you're entitled to your opinion. And I, th <laughs> I, think, I think we overlook class a lot because I think classism sometimes can be just as uh, deceitful and awful as the racism. Okay. How, go ahead, John. I, was was say, to say I think there's another component that's going on uh, that's in the mix of uh, different things we're talking about here, but there seems to be an anti-intellectual mm -hmm. uh, stream coming mm -hmm. from a lot of the rhetoric now. It's all, and, it, and again, it's across the spectrum, but it almost seems like, uh, especially now we have a leader who's highly educated right. and 
wow, you know, he makes a target for those for for whatever reason, have not been able to or been locked out of that system, uh, but haven't been able to attain what he's been able to attain. So now we know that he is the president for all people, so. It's difficult, I would think, for him to react to a lot of the things that are happening, at least publicly, um, and to come out. But there are others around him who can, such as Jimmy Carter did, for example. But I don't see a big groundswell. There's no Why? groundswell whatsoever because no. you're still missing a point. Forty years ago, we didn't have to worry about health care in our communities because we had Norfolk Community Hospital and we had Peninsula Hospital. We had the savings and loans. We had our own banks. We had our own infrastructure. We didn't have where we have the kinds of our, our, the babies that are being born in our communities don't have a dad in 80% of the households, where the average incomes of the people across the street in the power in the projects is $8,000 a year. Obama shouldn't be about black people, or neither should we be concerned about uh, even electing black officials. We should be able to elect Virginians who are going to stand for the things that we collectively believe in. This black white thing game is over. It's out. You got a black president, you're on your own. That is what people are saying. So stop making excuses. That is what people are saying. It's not, mm -hmm. but it's not accurate. But that's what Obama and said. It, but it, and, and, and if Obama is saying that, and I haven't heard him say that, by the he way. He said you're on yeah. your own. Uh, no more excuses. He said no more excuses, but, I, but, but Bill, don't you think that really he was talking about being able to work yourself, to pull yourself up, and to do the things that you know are right, to make your family stronger, to make the economy stronger, et cetera? My little last comment, too many white people and too many black people aren't working. They need to go to work. They need to get educated. We got to graduate more than 50% of the kids that start our schools. Mm -hmm. We have to go to work and do what's necessary and stop depending on government or some city council to take care of us and take I care of ourselves. I don't think anybody, mm -hmm. there's, I don't think there's anybody mm -hmm. who would disagree that, some, that people need to work. I don't think there's anybody mm -hmm. who would disagree that people need education. But we have some harsh realities. And harsh realities is that over the last 40 years, in this whole process, what we've done is we've decimated families, and yeah. now we're asking them, and now we're turning around after we broke up the families. Now we're turning around as a country and saying, and saying, and saying fix it yourself. Mm -hmm. You broke it, and now you want us to fix it ourselves. It doesn't happen that way. They didn't break, the black family didn't break down because of the fact that the black family wanted to break down. That's the black had. family broke down because of certain moves that the government made. So now we're in a situation where we have a, gener a couple of generations of people, two generations of people who have grown up not having the same expectations, not being given the same expectations that 40 years ago mm -hmm. were just a given for us. We were brought up to say, do well in school, do the very best you can, work yourself out of the poverty. Of poverty. That right. was a part of the way it was. But if you don't create an environment, if you don't maintain an environment mm -hmm. to allow that to happen, to foster that, then what do you expect to end up with? We're almost out of town. John, I, I, I just want to say, <laughs> to hear this dialogue and to be in the middle of this dialogue, I think is constructive because if it doesn't do anything else, it holds up that no matter black, white, or, and, and by having a black, white conversation, we're leaving a whole lot of folks out of the dialogue. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we can have people in the same group who have widely divergent opinions, that's news to some folks. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had that in some of my classes, and people are scratching their heads saying, oh, what? We're, we're black, so we're supposed but, to yeah, be I, I, I think that's an assumption that <laughs> a lot is. of people Well, and make. I was going to say, where does that assumption come from, that all black people have to think alike? We don't think that all white people have to think alike. It's different. There's a, it's, 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 it's one of those stand, it's one of those two different sets of standards. It is perfectly okay yes. for the two of them to sit there and disagree all day long, but we're it never is. supposed it to do is. that. And Fine. actually, we perpetuate it because when we don't challenge Agreed. each other, that's true, and then and just sit back and agree, then we feed into the myth that the black community, I call it the mythical black community, <laughs> the um, the black community is somehow another monolithic. We are yeah. not. Yeah. Exactly. But I, exactly. I grew up in segregated times in white, all white community, and I literally was taught that all black folks know each other. And, and so, yeah, therefore, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, related, I, right? yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. as crazy as that sounds, and I suspect I'm not 
the only one the in the one. country right. who was brought up that way, and I suspect there are probably still folks being brought up that way. Mm -hmm. Let me you ask Bev a quick question. We've got about two minutes left. What are white people talking about with um, this whole racist racism and they are, they're not that are the ones that I know are not talking that much uh, and there's the and there's the trouble um, in fact even in dialogues uh, sometimes one of the hardest part mm -hmm. we we had was getting white folks to get engaged because they don't have to I mean that's the honest to God's truth mm -hmm. they don't have to and and they therefore they don't they don't want to and they need to what oh. they're saying behind closed doors Mm -hmm. Black people, we've given you all you're going to get. Get out the boat, roar it yourself. You got a black president. You go, need to take care of your own self. Marry the man that's going to give you your babies. Create families, create jobs, go to work because you're on your own. And on that mm -hmm. note, we're going to have to end because the conversation, we're all out of time and we're on our own. But you know, I would love to continue this conversation um, as we go forward because I think it's important so that people can understand that it is okay for four and five intelligent people to sit and have this type of conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank the show you. today. Thank you, Barbara. And our thanks to Vivian J. Page, John L. Johnson, Bev Sell, and Bill Thomas for their thoughtful insight. Up next, meet the Kingdom Kids. But first, here's a look at what's happening in Hampton Roads. Welcome back. You don't have to look hard to see the negative images that our children and grandchildren are exposed to through television, the internet, books, magazines, and video games. So it's always refreshing when something comes along that promotes positive messages. Tonight, Lisa Godley introduces us to one man from Hampton who is using media to take an uplifting word into the hearts and homes of children everywhere. <laughs> What started here at First Baptist Church Hampton as one man's ministry of teaching children music has blossomed into a project that could eventually reach millions. It's called Kingdom Kids, and 30-year-old Joshua Head is the creator. We didn't have a lot of music for kids uh, that was suitable for their voices, that was urban and fun, et cetera, like a lot of the uh, contemporary gospel music. So I began to arrange original music for uh, the children at the church that I work with. As a result, the Kingdom Kids CD was born, but Joshua felt there was much more that could be done. Now we're going to learn the sign language movements to the words of the song, Thank You, Lord. When I work with kids, we do sign language, we do dance, we do choreography. So I wanted something that kids could experience, and I wanted something that Sunday school teachers and uh, persons who might not have the training that I have uh, could use it with their kids. Instead of Joshua being on the video, he thought, why not create a DVD using animation to teach children skills like singing, dancing, and sign language? He also decided to make the main characters very diverse. This is Crystal. As you see, she's a young Spanish girl, plays the guitar, very vibrant. This is Nate. Nate plays the drums, and he's really uh, excited about drums. And this is Justin. He plays the bass guitar. And uh, Justin uh, also teaches dance as well, so he's into choreography. And this is Amani, uh, who is a young girl who plays the keyboard. So Amani, Justin, Nate, Crystal. So those are the four characters in Kingdom Kids. While the idea came from working with children, only one of the Kingdom Kids is actually modeled after someone Joshua knows. Amani is modeled after his oldest daughter, Jada, who also sings on the CD. The family connection continues with Joshua's wife, Kendra. It's time to do the Kingdom Kids video. We're going to learn some fun, sharp dance moves. And Playing the teacher on the Kingdom Kids DVD. Miss Elaine is all about the kids, so she would say, All right, kids, are you ready to go? She just has a more enthusiastic... She likes to dance, so she just has a more uh, energetic feel to her. Since the CD came out, Kingdom Kids has really taken off. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
just came out in June. Churches have been calling us, what are we going to do? We've talked to some persons with network, and we decided we're going to make it an actual TV show. So the show will have a storyline. We have begun production for the show. Uh, and so it will tell the life story of these young people who learn life lessons. They learn lessons about life, about love, about uh, being great persons and having high, high self-esteem. And we use the performing arts such as dance and music and sign language to bring them together at this place that we call the Kingdom School. Joshua hopes Kingdom Kids will help children, parents, and teachers overcome obstacles. He sees a lot of people in urban communities hurting, many struggling with self-esteem. But if Crystal, Nate, Justin, and Amani have their way, people will learn how to be positive when their surroundings aren't, and possibly learn a song or a dance move along the way. The Kingdom Kids CD is available in stores right now. Look for the DVD in stores next month, and on a special note, the television program in the spring of 2010. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And if you'd like more information about the Kingdom Kids, check out our website at www.anotherview.tv. And that's our show for this evening. But before we go, we want to say a very dear we're sorry to the Tidewater Chapter of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. We've announced their college weekend trip to Greensboro on November 7th, but inadvertently called them the phone company AT&T. If you have a student interested in attending A&T, please go to www.tidewateraggiealum.org or call 757-472-2609 to register for University Weekend. And a special thanks to Lisa Godley, Mark Burnett, and the rest of the production crew for filling in for me while I spent time with my first grandchild, Patience. Being a grandmother is a very special thing. Next week, African-American philanthropy. We'll see you then for another view. <laughs>